This audio production was made in collaboration with Audible Anarchist. The Right to be Greedy Theses on the Practical Necessity of Demanding Everything by For Ourselves The positive conception of egoism, the perspective of communist egoism, is the very heart and unity of our theoretical and practical coherence. This perspective is the essence of what separates us from both the left and the right. We cannot allow its fundamental importance to be obscured, or ourselves to be mistaken for either the right or the left. We cannot allow any Leninist organization to get away with claiming that it is only a little bit pregnant with state capitalism. Introduction 1. Greed, in its fullest sense, is the only possible basis of communist society. 2. The present forms of greed lose out, in the end, because they turn out to be not greedy enough. 3. The repression of egoism can never totally succeed, except as the destruction of human subjectivity, the extinction of the human species itself, because egoism is an essential moment of human subjectivity. Its repression simply means that it returns in a hidden, duplicitous form. If it cannot show itself in the open market, it will find itself or create for itself a black market. If it is not tolerated in transparent relations, the repressed self will split in two, into a represented self, a personal organization of appearances, a persona, and that which cringes and plots behind this character armor. The repression of egoism, contrary to the dictates of every one of the so-called communists in opposition to Marx and Engels, from Lenin right down to Mao, can never be the basis of communist society. Moreover, the repressive conception of communism misses precisely the whole point. It misses out on the validity of the egoistic moment. This is true even in the inverted form in which it emerges from an imminent critique of altruistic ideology. If I die, the world dies for me. Without life, I cannot love another. However, what it misses in theory i.e. in its ideological representations, it nonetheless preserves in practice, and precisely with the help of that very ideology. Its real basis is the egoism of the state capitalist bureaucracy. This ideology of self-sacrifice serves admirably the task of extracting surplus labor from the proletariat. The actual negation of narrow egoism is a matter of transcendence, aufibung, of the transition from a narrow to a qualitatively expanded form of egoism. The original self-expansion of egoism was identically the demise of the primitive community, but its further self-expansion will resolve itself into a community once again. It is only when greed itself at last, or rather once again, beckons in the direction of community that that direction will be taken. Here the ancient Christian truth that no earthly force can withstand human greed, rejoins us on our side of the barricades. 4. It was the struggle over their growing wealth which rent asunder the early tribal and village communities. The elaboration of the patriarchal pattern, the growth of exchange relations of usury, debt slavery, and war, can all be traced to this. It is only when the same motive which originally occasioned this dissolution of community calls for its reconstitution the community can be constituted again. And this motive is simply the struggle for a richer life. For only that motive is irresistible. Only that motive, greed, can undo its own work. It is only when that subjective moment, through the historical deepening of its own possibility, turns against its own present objectification, in a word, capital, capitalist private property, private appropriation, that is, privatization, exclusion, society as an association of strangers of estrangement, in short, the totality of alienation, that the threshold of the great transformation is reached. And the struggle of this new subjectivity against the previous objectification, global capitalist society, in a word, capital, the process of the negation of that objectification is the communist revolution. 5. We have no doubt that people are corruptible, but we know for ourselves that there are things more tempting, more seductive than money, capital, and power. So much so 
that no genuinely greedy human being could possibly resist their allure. And it is upon this corruptibility of man that we found our hopes for revolution. Revolution is nothing other than the self-accelerating spread throughout society of this more profound corruption, of this deeper seduction. Currently, greed is always pursued and associated with isolation and privatism simply because everyone under the reign of capital is condemned to pursue greed in this narrow way. Greed doesn't yet know its own potentiality. We say once again, the present forms of greed lose out in the end because they turn out to be not greedy enough. 6. Narrow greed is a holdover from times of natural scarcity. Its desires are represented to itself in the form of commodities, power, sex objects, and even more abstractly, as money and as images. We are told in a thousand ways that only these things are worth having by rulers who work to ensure that these are the only things available to be bought. The survival of the narrow greed in a world of potential plenty is propagated in the form of ideology by those very people who control access to these things. Ultimately, in our daily lives, we suffer the humiliation of being forced accomplices in the maintenance of this scarcity, this poverty of choices. 7. Narrow greed will turn against itself. No more powerful weapon against greed could possibly be found than greed itself. There could be no more formidable tool for transforming narrow selfishness than this selfishness itself. In its own process, through its own development, it must discover a fuller form of greed and a richer form of wealth. It must discover its own narrowness. A frontal assault on someone's narrow selfishness will run up against his strongest defenses. Wouldn't it be easier to turn that strength around upon itself? Wouldn't it be easier to induce that person to transform him herself through his her own desires? This is the method of seduction. It involves speaking from what is most radical in you to what is most radical in the other person. That is, speaking from what you really have in common, root subjectivity, radical subjectivity, the basis at last historically discovered upon which to work out the construction of authentic community. This is the method of imminent critique, of the evocation of self-critique. It is the practice of dialectic itself. Hic rotis, hic salta. 8. The perspective of communist egoism is the perspective of that selfishness which desires nothing so much as other selves, of that egoism which wants nothing so much as other egos, of that greed which is greedy to love, love being the total appropriation of man by man. 9. Our reversal of perspective on egoism, our detournement of greed, and the scandalous effect which this produces and is intended to produce in the prevailing consciousness, is no mere formal trick and no arbitrary play on words. Words, and precisely because of their meanings, are a real part of history, of the historical material and of the historical process. To abandon them to their usurpers, to invent new words or to use other words because of the difficulty of winning back the true historic words, is to abandon the field to the enemy. It is a theoretical concession and a practical concession which we cannot afford. To do so would only add to the confusion, a confusion which, in part, forms the basis of the established order. Our reversal of perspective, on the contrary, is clarifying within the very terms of the confusion. It is already a revolutionary act at the level of the subjective conditions of revolution. The reversed perspective, the revolved perspective, is the perspective of revolution itself. Ideology is the sublime hustle. The use value of ideology is as a tool for exploitation. The ideologue uses ideology to con you into letting him put his egoism above yours in the name of altruism, morality, and the general interest. Are winning back in a positive connotation of a word like greed or selfishness, the central, universal, and mutually agreed-upon pejoratives of the two extreme representations of modern capitalism, private capitalist and state capitalist ideology, which try to confine the totality of possible opposition within the universe bounded by their polar pseudo-opposition, is such an act because it locates precisely the point of their essential unity, the exact point of departure for a revolutionary movement which, by breaking away there, simultaneously, identically, and singularly 
breaks with both. No less is our expropriation of a word like communism such an act, for it is already an expropriation of the expropriators. The free world is not free, and the communist world is not communist. 10. We use the words communist society to mean the direct opposite of that which masquerades as such in the present world, namely bureaucratic state capitalism. That the classical private capitalist societies of the West, themselves maturing toward a form of state capitalism, collude with Eastern powers in the propagation of this lie is hardly an accident, and should come as no surprise. It is rather one facet among myriads of an antagonistic cooperation which reveals the hidden essential unity binding together these pseudo-opposites. The true communist society begins with the expropriation of the whole of capitalist society by the associated producers, which, if we are to judge by the numerous historical attempts at this process so far, will take the form of global organization of workplace, community, regional, etc., councils, the workers' councils, or, to use their original Russian name, expropriated, in fact, as in name, by the Bolshevik bureaucrats, the Soviets. 11. We conceive the realized social individual, communist man, as having for his property, that is, for the object of his appropriation, his whole society, the totality of his social life. All of society is wealth for him. His intercourse with his society, i.e. his living relations with the rest of the social individuals and their objectification, is in its totality the appropriation of social life. Productive activity becomes a form of individual consumption, just as consumption itself is a form of self-production. The activity of simultaneous appropriation by each individual of all the rest, or of the appropriation of society by all at once, interappropriation, realized intersubjectivity or co-property, itself constitutes the totality of social production. This appropriation by all at once of all is none other than the resonant state of egoism. Communism is the positive abolition of private property, of human self-alienation, and is thus the real appropriation of human nature through and for man. In communist society, according to its concept, the form of intercourse becomes the total appropriation of man by man. Social individuals can appropriate one another subjectively, i.e. as subjects, and all-sidedly, through all the forms of human intercourse, by talking together, producing together, making love together, etc., etc., and all the fruits of their appropriation, i.e. themselves and their developed richness, become thus the property of themselves, and of all society, of all the other social individuals. The fruits of your appropriation, of your consumption of physical and emotional riches, is something from which I am excluded at the level of immediacy, of immediate consumption. You eat the pear, therefore I cannot eat just that bite of just that pear. You share your love with this person, and I am perhaps excluded from sharing myself at this moment with you. But this is not at all a problem for me, for I am busy elsewhere, with the same project and praxis of self-enrichment on my own and together with others. But later, immediately, when I come back to you, your appropriation and the self-enrichment you derive from it comes back to me, becomes my consumption, my appropriation, in my appropriation of you, and is the richer for it. Today, we have to be jealous of each other's pleasures, not because our pleasures are so many and so great, but because they are so meager and so few. Here, on the other side of poverty, on the other side of scarcity, my jealousy would only deprive myself. My exclusion of your pleasure would only exclude my own, and I am free at last to take pleasure in your pleasure. Whereas, within the realm of poverty, your strength is a threat to me, your development is at the expense of mine, and in general, your addition is my subtraction. On the contrary, in the society of realized wealth, your strength is my strength, the inner wealth of your being is my wealth, my property, and every one of your human powers is a multiplication of my own. Thus, the contradiction between my consumption and yours, between my appropriation, my property, and yours, the conflict between my well-being and yours becomes its opposite, synthesis, identity, inter-reinforcement, inter-amplification, 
resonance. 12. The positive conception of egoism, the perspective of communist egoism, is the very heart and unity of our theoretical and practical coherence. This perspective is the essence of what separates us from both the left and the right. We cannot allow its fundamental importance to be obscured or ourselves to be mistaken for either the right or the left. We cannot allow any Leninist organization to get away with claiming that it is only a little bit pregnant with state capitalism. This has been a production of Audible Anarchist. You can find more Audible Anarchist on YouTube.